Hackers attack systems that are not patched. You need protection, but virtual patching isn't working. That's why you go patchless. Topia analyzes, prioritizes, and remediates vulnerabilities before they're exploited. Even the zero days, all from one interface. Security gets better memory defense to complement endpoint strategy while improving overall vulnerability management and compliance. Adopt a hacker's mindset, eliminate vulnerability. Get your 30-day free trial at securityweekly.com forward slash vicarious. Sophisticated attackers are targeting credentials to escalate privileges. Ativo Networks provides an innovative solution that finds, cleans, and monitors exposed credentials to reduce attack surfaces. Additionally, the solution alerts when attackers try accessing Active Directory objects while hiding data and derailing them with disinformation. Organizations can go one step further and hide real credentials among deceptive lures that lead attackers to decoys for recording TTPs and forensic evidence. Find out more at securityweekly.com forward slash Ativo Networks and sign up for a free trial. NetSparker, the developers of a comprehensive automated web security platform that includes web vulnerability scanning, assessment, and management. NetSparker's desktop and cloud-based security solutions employ a unique and dead accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities and provides a proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at securityweekly.com forward slash NetSparker. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. Would you like to have all of your favorite Security Weekly content at your fingertips, learn about upcoming webcast and technical trainings, or just wish you could hang out with the Security Weekly cast and crew and community? Visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe, sign up for the mailing list, join our Discord server, and subscribe to all of the shows on the network, including a show hosted by Jeff Mann. Security and Compliance Weekly, which is a fabulous show, as well as all, all of our shows. Uh, Application Security Weekly. I've actually spent some time listening to some of the other shows that I'm not on because it's, I just, wow, I haven't done that in a while. Uh, and I've been doing that. It's uh, awesome, awesome content. So slash subscribe to check that out. I also, um, since we mentioned it during the break, Jack Resider of Darknet Diaries. I want to give him a plug because I tell you what, I listened to his episode on Olympic Destroyer with Andy Greenberg. Super impressed. Tyler's nodding his head like, yep, I had launched with those Russian hackers last week. It's all it's all good. I feel like you're <laughs> our clandestine uh, threat nation state uh, <laughs> threat uh, expert that can't talk about it in any case. Uh, that was that was really good stuff. And uh, Jeff, you are coming, going on, uh, appearing on an, an episode, or did you say was that I'm not supposed to say that on the air? Or yeah, well, cats out of the bag now. <laughs> uh, I I will be recording next week. I, I don't know what the delay is, how long it takes for him to do post production because he puts out a you know pretty good product. It it is a yeah, it's very different uh, product from our show. Uh, where there's a lot extremely of extremely different, yeah, splicing that, uh, but it's he's doing a great job. He is so you know, sometime in the future, I'll keep you guys posted. Yeah, don't you know what? Don't even tell us the topic. We just I wanted everyone to be in suspense, but I kind of, yeah, like, I mean, I kind of like, like big surprise, right? What, it's, what we're going to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> what are we going to talk about but, now with the stories for the week? Unless I do, I have another announcement. Oh, wait. Webcasts for all upcoming webcast technical trainings. Why you should stop trying to discover and classify data that actually happened today. Uh, Ativo Networks is doing adversary playbook: How deception thwarts attackers with Tony Cole, chief technology officer at Ativo. Uh, what's the next one, Johnny? Throw it up on the on the screen for me. Uh, can a prioritize to prediction building risk based vulnerability management programs uh, with Ed Bellis, co founder and CTO of Kenna. Talking about prioritization of vulnerability. Securityweekly.com forward slash webcasts to uh, register for those. So make sure you do that. Uh, we did one today with Secure Circle, which was interesting because when I looked at data protection, <clears throat> your data security policies, and how you would protect data, I, I started putting together these slides that I pulled from an internal presentation that I was working on. And I started putting Star Wars memes in there. And then before I knew it, I had about, you know, six to seven slides on how to apply data protection to the plans for the Death Star in the Star Wars movies, which I was, I thought was made for great 
talking points. The folks from Secure Circle, like Peter, immediately picked up on that and was running with it in, uh, in his slides. So it was a pretty good example of how not to try and protect data from Star Wars in the Empire, uh, but made for, I think, a lively conversation. So forward slash on demand, securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. If you missed that one today, make sure you go check it out. Because, I mean, we talk Star Wars nerdiness as well. All righty. Stories. Stories, stories, stories. Where do you want to start? I think we should start one around uh, cryptography. Jeff might love this one. This was actually a great article. By this the way. was my story number eighteen. It's like the one article that I didn't I didn't read because I got tired. And it was at the bottom of the list, and I <laughs> I didn't write it up. I flagged it earlier in the week, and so hopefully someone else picked up on it and, and read it. I read it earlier in the week, and it was uh, it was fascinating. Um, so essentially, what's called I/O or indistinguishable uh, obfuscation. Obfuscation. It's kind of yeah. It's a kind of a, a cryptography like. Uh, theory and pie in the sky that they've been working towards where you essentially can't tell the difference between encrypted and unencrypted data, uh, even Ooh. using things like entropy and uh, histography and stuff like that. So apparently researchers have finally found a way in which to do this at multiple levels. Uh, and so that brings about an entirely new realm of kind of crypto cryptographic possibilities. And so there's there's a bunch of research around that, and the paper's fascinating. So, uh, Jeff, maybe you would like to, to hop in on this one. I can pop in, but uh, I think I learned more from you describing the article than I got mm. out of the article. Um, uh, my take, you know, I kept reading it, it's like, okay, get to the, what did you actually do? Get to the, what, do you, what did you actually do? So it, it's, it's still somewhat theoretical, um, uh, and it's still susceptible to quantum computing because you know they're basically trying to figure out ways to use the 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 essential elements of existing algorithms and the one that they cited as an example is uh you know the the belief that nobody can in a reasonable amount of no computer can in a in a reasonable amount of time uh factor uh two large primes um and, and you know that's the basis for a lot of uh, public key cryptography. So you know the, the they they say they figured out a way to apply that to the I/O challenge, the Holy Grail problem. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, I'm not a mathematician. It, I'm not that kind of a crippy. So <laughs> I, I didn't is, get a whole lot out of the it. Math and, and they do break the math out pretty, you know, yeah, they pretty did. granularly, and it's it's not too bad. But overall, like the fact that this can be applied to any of the current uh, crypt cryptographic um, ciphers, I think that makes it even more interesting. That that allows us to further advance this very quickly. If it, you know, if it pans out, obviously crypto takes a little bit of time. There's a lot of uh, peer review. There's a lot of people that are trying to hammer on it, look for for vulnerabilities within it. But when they were uh, looking at how they did the the math and the maps, um, it was uh, the new the new way they did the pseudo randomness uh, generating the the 2.5 map was just absolutely fascinating and i think this has a lot of potential and possibility it was if this does work this provides us a lot of um, a lot of interesting challenges where we're not going to be able to determine if a bad actor or a good you know maybe a political dissident or someone is actually utilizing something like a VPN or encryption, uh, it makes it indistinguishable from the plain text. And that provides a lot of, uh, a lot of advantages and disadvantages from both a, a kind of a nation state and surveillance state uh, kind of point of view, as well as from uh, our ability to do analysis on communication and SIGINT stuff. So uh, there's, there's a ton of stuff coming down the pipe there. I had another... I can Go ahead, Jeff. Final, final thought, Paul. I'm sorry. Uh, I I can see how Tyler would be a little bit more jazzed about it because I do see it much more of uh, applying to nation state issues, as it were. But math question for you, Tyler. In terms of orders of magnitude, they're you know talking about the two factors that they needed and the three factors they needed. If we're talking exponentially type things, two point five isn't technically halfway, is it? It's not. It's it's where they're adding. They're adding 
a different variable of the point in uh, your one map or a map and then mm-hmm. you're kind of a b they're taking and squaring that out and then they're applying the a and c maps to the third to the third set of maps so it's not def- it's technically three different mappings or or degrees uh, so it's not really 2.5 but that's what they're calling it i think it's the radius multiplied times pi by the circumference <laughs> it's, it's the height and the base <laughs> divided by two so the a squared plus Mike? b squared hey you know what J- J- junior high geometry is something i had done no joke. It's, it's I'm, not geometry. Kidding, like, I'm like well wait a minute hold on my whole oh, youtube yeah, really right now is like common core math mm-hmm. like learning <laughs> uh speaking of math so i did my, have another my question was how how much is the overhead to do this i mean i get I'm not huge on the math, but I'm like, what's the difference between what we're doing now and this in terms of overhead and compute power? It seems like it could be rather a leap for a lot of things that are doing it, Because of the way the polynom- polynomials um, are calculated, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't do it exponentially by adding uh, the additional mapping variables. Uh, so I don't, think it, I don't think it takes a ton more computing power. There was another uh, crypto sort of related story. Um, bugs in critical infrastructure gear allow sophisticated cyber attacks. And I was like, they basically they brute forced the key. And I'm like, well, no, nah, not exactly because there were two vulnerabilities that made the uh, deriving the key much, much easier. Larry, I think this really speaks to many different attacks against uh, Wi-Fi 802.11 as well as Bluetooth uh, that we've observed in the past. So basically they state, we were we are able to run an exhaustive key search, which is interesting. They don't call it like brute forcing uh, the, the key. <laughs> it's an exhaustive key search to identify the encryption key that is, that is used to encrypt the hashed password used to protect the application on the PLC. Pop quiz, what's the difference between <clears throat> brute forcing and exhaustive? Known key space? No, there is nothing. <laughs> They're synonymous. <laughs> it's just difference in terminology, right? I mean, if you're hey, attempting, it's attempting every, brute forcing yeah. could essentially go on forever, right? If if you're exhausting, you know the start and the in end. In the end, right? For something like an eight eight character key space, you can exhaust that full list, and there's just no, nothing else to try. And that's so more what they're doing. The yeah, force. and that's but, more what they're doing that's, here. But you're also describing brute forcing. It brute is fi- yeah. brute forcing is dis- is trying all combinations. It's nuances. It's, it's more... T- uh, anyway. Uh, so, But then they say, actually, in the article, the brute force effort <laughs> was made possible thanks to two flaws the researchers like discovered. <clears throat> First, the random nonce and secret key used in the encryption process are exchanged in clear text. Oh, good God. Yep. Um, then they say, secondly, the seed that is used to generate the keys is only two bytes long, meaning okay, there are God. only 65,535 possible combinations Wait, of the seed. Where have we seen this before? This sounds familiar. Like, <laughs> like what? Is it WEP? There's a couple places. It, it, like a couple like places. places. It existed in uh, one of, of the stuff. Microsoft bugs very recently. Oh, it, that was the, um, mm-hmm. the logon one, right? Recently, yeah. It's basically Man, it poor. Right. It's poor implementation <laughs> of crypto, which is really what it almost always comes down to. Yep. Right? So, Je- so Je- yeah. Yeah. Paul, always. to me, it reminds me of a combination of WEP and MyFair, mm-hmm. and you know, I, I'd probably venture to guess that uh, the nonces that they select are probably not all that random, which also reminds me of some WEP. Yep. Um, oh, sorry, not WEP. WPA yep, and WPA. some uh, MyFair issues, and like. Well, yeah. in the, in this case, the the random nonce and secret key was sent in the clear, which that it doesn't matter how random they are if you're sending them in the clear. Yeah. Wow. Uh, why do you need That's to send the bad. secret key? Like. Uh, yeah, that I, I it's I I, I I didn't dig in any further other than I I thought this little snippet was a a good you know uh, talking point, but. Yeah. And and which story of that was yours, Paul? My, my story number nine. Okay. Yeah, and, and this was specific to PLCs. So we could have fun with Paul's number 12. Number 12. Microsoft devises 
that user there's a couple of mfa articles in here the uh, microsoft ad advises users to stop using sms and voice based mfa the headline is slightly deceiving because that's not i i don't know if that's exactly what they said but uh, uh who was the guy was it larry wine weiner um i believe but was why? his name uh, they say um Microsoft Alex noted Weiner. that using any form of MFA is better than relying on just a password for security as it yeah. significantly increases the cost for attackers, which is why the rate of compromised accounts using any type of MFA is less than 0.1% of the general population. Right. Really? So I don't know about I don't know about the that. only the problem I have with the, the the headline is that when you use the out of the box Microsoft IDP they're their authenticator solution, you have three options for multi-factor. You can use the Microsoft Authenticator, mm -hmm. you can use SMS, or phone verification. Out of the box, that's it. Um, so now they just the, took two it, of those and, off and, the table. And the, and the phone is the voice one, right? And now that's right. when it's they a, read a code to you, or is that the my voice is my passport? Verified. No, no, this is the... I will. Re I will. the The phone call will tell you a code that you enter into the dialog box on the on the authenticator. So it's a different way of sending you the pin, basically. So pretty much. Question, really, is is now I know the opposite side of this because we've abused the crap out of like SMS, but honestly, from a non-targeted approach of general security, is SMS and voice really that much worse? No, I don't. I don't think so. I think it has to be a targeted attack. To the the way I've seen this play out is. I call up your cell phone provider after I figure out who you are, what your phone number is to target you. I call up your cell phone provider and I socially engineer someone on the other end of the phone, uh, basically to transfer the number to my SIM card or some, some such attack. Like you, that. usually the easiest way that this is abused. And, and the, I think the, the major reason that a lot of these places are doing this is the ability for things like Google voice to get a text message that is then on your mm -hmm. computer, which is how we usually do it. Like we'll just sit on the computer and watch it or iMessage if your iMessage mm -hmm. account right. or your iPhone is connected to your Mac yep. and it gets a text like, and I'm already compromised your machine, then yeah, your two factors compromised. But at that point, right. you're already key logging usually, and then you have a race condition. So mm -hmm. you'll either do that, uh, or you'll put up a, a spoofed, you know, two factor phishing page and have them enter it, pass their authentication through, as you take and uh, take their cookie or session. So I, I I like the extra protection that I think a physical token gives you, even above and beyond an authenticator app. It's why I use YubiKey. For almost all all my accounts that that will support it, uh, especially my password fault, like that has a physical YubiKey token that I I, I have to I have yeah. to press. Someone someone's got a black bag you at that point, and you know I guess if that's the case, then I know that I'm targeted and I'm black bagged. And it so I it got comes down problems. to Mike. We talk about throwbacks, Mike Kershaw, and you know I I can only get so good as a battery connected to my nipples kind of thing this Ooh, someone wants to go through that much trouble to, to get my passwords and my you know second factor well but. at that point you would know that they're compromised and therefore again you've got bigger problems either you're being disposed of or you know what they're after is <laughs> not pertaining directly to you and it's a much bigger problem and someone else will have to deal with it yeah i just i hope my my safeguards kick in and and everyone on the show gets some kind of covert messaging communication that's like I'm in trouble, and to get me out, there's that thing in that place I hid that one time, and you know how to get me out. <laughs> I mean, we, we, should, we should really talk about that protocol should. and like, get that kind we of should. updated from a disaster recovery planning right. standpoint. Yes. How do we know you're the real Tom Liston? Right. Mm. Only Tom Liston would ask that. <laughs> but coming to, I, so I, I, I think, really, I kind of draw the, the three. Uh, in the Authenticator app, I need to do more research in because... Largely, I had a bad experience using the Google Authenticator that when I started changing phones, as I... I early liked, on? I, yeah, early on, I changed phones, and all of a sudden, my Authenticator app it was completely oh, different, and it wasn't transferring over, and I'm like, this is bull. 
I'm like, and that's I'm going what, that's to get when it. I was writing like custom ROMs and Cyanogen mod was out and we were doing, you know, five ROMs a week and yeah, I it gets like, really tedious. I was like, that's no way. I, I was like, no way. I like to change phones and I want a physical token that is independent from my phone, but it's gotten better. Now when I change phones, my authenticator app can still maintain those so authentications. That, that is only, that yeah. is only the case uh, between platforms. If you switch from an iPhone to an Android, mm -hmm. you have a problem. If I you gotcha. switch the alternate way, you also have a problem. <laughs> I have an app for that, um, but you're absolutely right. Out of the by by default, staying within the platform is okay. Mm -hmm. There is one TOTP app called Authy that will store your stuff in the cloud if you trust the mm -hmm. password yeah. not to be compromised. That's the other thing. That's the you know that you're putting your TOTP seeds at risk. Unless you throw, Microsoft, can you go duo? Can you go duo as well and probably be agnostic from the phone platform? No, probably. so do that. Duo is specific to that, and that's uh, the one I was referring to. Mm -hmm. Is duo is the one I I use personally, but it does not go platform to platform because of the gotcha. way the seed and algorithm is is calculated. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so that that's so why on, I like. Uh, that's why Discord I like. Mentioned, go ahead. Um, MFA, uh, they ha they had done a uh, authentication standard, and they called MFA. They had a weak MFA uh, call out and a strong MFA call out, which I think is very mm. true, right? When you're talking about um, a hardware token or some additional uh, strong MFA versus like SMS or an IP location. Yeah, I mean, I I could see enterprises or even companies just adopting a strategy where there are certain users <clears throat> that do a physical hardware MFA and other users that might be using an app and other users that maybe are SMS. Uh, I, I would think you'd probably standardize on the app over SMS if that was uh, an option. But I think when you get into larger organizations, as many of us probably have experienced, a physical token is really super hard to support. Uh, yes, in that, it is. right. That's that's what I've come down to, and I don't think that's changed even today. I, I, I think do the like the Yubikey word devices, is EITA. I think that's the phrase you're looking for. What is it? P I T A. Pain yes, in the ass. Pain in the ass. Yeah, because yeah, people they, are just calling. Uh, it, what if I'm made it a lot easier, and they've they've offered some enterprise management solutions sure. and the ability to do like backup tokens and. Uh, save those secondary devices like you always have to have those mm -hmm. from an enterprise standpoint so they're they're trying to get to that point but <clears throat> you are at that point where you know you're storing additional physical tokens that's that becomes difficult and what if i'm traveling what if we <laughs> pretend there's not covid and i'm traveling and maybe i'm traveling internationally and i lose my token how are you going to get me my backup token if i'm in a, in another country somewhere or is there some kind of, it, but then the other thing is what if it falls back to an authenticator app or SMS, but then that reduces the security that you have in your physical token? All interesting risk-based decisions. AI and biometrics will solve all this. We got it. Well, then there's all the whole <laughs> passwordless thing. And then I steal. And then I go total recall on you, and I steal your eyes. Well, oh, yeah. yeah, but then there's other. Um, I forget which company. Uh, does it, and I don't want to say the company and attribute this uh, uh, patented uh, technology where, regardless of what phone you have, they you can use your camera to take a picture of your fingers, and they actually uh, analyze your fingerprints, and, and that's your second factor. I I thought that was really cool, actually, for phones that may maybe don't have a fingerprint reader, um, or if there's facial recognition on the phone, and you're wearing a mask all the time. <laughs> And, you know, then, then it's not valid, which is interesting. I went to Pixel 5. They've ditched the facial recognition entirely, and it's back to fingerprint reader. Yeah, the fingerprint readers do do a little bit better job. But anything that anything that is taking a picture and making a digital representation of itself, it, it can be copied, saved, restored. Like there's just or, you know, fingers cut off at that point. But yeah, then, like, fingers cut off is a, hard, is a hard one to defend against. I want to say they had some anti-spoofing you know they all do to what degree uh, the level that they go through to implement that is 
you know, up to the their palm, discretion. The palm readers seem to be some of the best. The wrist and palm readers that look and do um, vascular analysis yep. because you have to be live. It has to be a certain temperature and you're looking at the, the veins, which do have a unique profile similar to fingerprints. So a little bit harder you know, to, uh, to spoof. I was watching, you know, because Sean Connery passed, passed away. away. Uh, I've been, you know, all of a sudden Netflix and Amazon Prime filled up with all sorts of Sean Connery movies. So I've been watching a bunch of uh, Sean Connery movies the last week or so. And I forget which James Bond movie I was watching, but uh, Gold, Gold they had it. Uh, it wasn't Goldfinger. It was in the it first was, couple. It was Diamonds Are Forever. Yep. Where um, uh, whatever the the woman's name was, she gets his fingerprints off of a glass. She mm-hmm. dusts the glass and checks it to to oh. verify that it's who he says he is. And then afterwards, he's like peeling off the the fake fingerprint thumbprint mm-hmm. off of his fingers, saying, "Oh, that really came in handy, Q." I mean that 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 movie came out in like 1970. Mm-hmm. So you know the idea of spoofing a fingerprint, you don't have to cut the finger off. You just need a copy of the fingerprint and put it on. Yep. Glue and put it on your finger. Right. Not a new. So, but, but speak, my comment in general, Sean, though. Uh, speaking of sorry, Sean Connery, though. real quick, I, yep. I just sprayed my couch with Febreze and now it smells like shit. Just. <laughs> <laughs> Alex Trebek also. Yes. Uh, yeah. Passed that away. Too. Yeah. <laughs> ain't, a bum, ain't a bum cover. I, if one of the funniest Saturday, one of the funniest skits, I think, in, in, in all series comedy. Of series of skits. I Yeah. One of the funniest. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, Diamonds are forever. Sorry. 1971. 71. 71. Yep. Which means it was filmed in 70. Mm. Um, yes. What I was going to say was, you know, for two-factor authentication, from a, you know, giving it to the masses from a consumer perspective, uh, I, I'm not sure you're going to do much better than something like SMS uh, or, you Agreed. know, something that goes to your phone, uh, you know, for higher... You know, for higher level applications like, uh, you know, ad- admin users, developers that need to get into, you know, or spooky people like Tyler that need to get into places and have a higher level of assurance, then I'm okay yes. with having these other discussions about what works and what doesn't and what's at risk, you know, what's riskier or not. But, you know, I mean, the credit union that I've been going to for, you know, since the mid 80s, when I went to work for a certain agency, I mean, they only started using uh, two factor authentication probably within the last five years. Um, and I, you know, I know other banks are notorious for that, you know, because I know oh, people that work with other banks. There's a list. My story number three, the sad oh, state of yeah, two factor authentication. Yeah, two factor org. Actually, and I'm not sure how accurate this website is. I didn't validate it in any way, shape, form, or fashion. But if you take that as truth, uh, twofactorauth.org list websites and whether or not they support 2FA, including the level of 2FA, whether it's email, yeah. whether it's SMS, mm-hmm. or whether it's a hardware-based token or an authenticator app. What I think is also a separate category in multi-factor authentication is email. That's really bad. <laughs> it might be like it should at least be SMS is the bar. Email is kind of like not really well, sh- like shame a on tiny you. Bit. Shame on you for code shifting the multi factor. We're talking two factor authentication here. I, I tend to term it as multi factor. But it's two factor. Two. It is. Because, it, yes. You know, I, and I, you I, like the movie Hackers. So what are you going to well, do? Uh, yeah. Well, the, there's that. <laughs> But one, one of the well, questions I have this, an though. account with is getting rid of security questions in favor of other multi-factor auth because too much um, OSINT gets the security question answered. Well, security so questions are secure. just more passwords, and that's really not a second factor. Uh, Jeff, no, it's <laughs> this not. This is your soapbox, no, right? Yeah, right. I mean, well, it, it's funny in the right direction. Uh, Yesterday was Veterans Day, and my daughter asked if I had a picture of uh, my stepfather, her grandfather, in uniform. He's a World War II veteran, so I was looking around. I couldn't find it, but I did find a picture of my grandfather. Uh, it's around here somewhere. Anyway, uh, he, he was a World War I veteran, and I, I think I posted it on Facebook or Twitter, I forget where I put it up and, you know, just in, you know, in honor of veterans day. And I was getting ready to type in his name and I'm like, well, shit, his name is my mother's maiden name. Can't do that. Mm. Uncle yep. Bob. Uncle Bob. 
Papal. Where do you want to go next? Oh, you know what? I wanted to talk about nothing to do with the stories. I want to talk about Apple's okay. announcement because I wanted to oh. get the the oh. other. Oh, I wanted to get the other hosts' take on this because I have a feeling, and I, I really kind of hope this this will be true that you all are going to come to the dark side and be a full Linux user like myself after Apple's announcement of the M1 chip. That don't get me wrong, I've read many of the articles and in, in descriptions of this chip. I think Apple's done a outstanding job designing this chip. It is absolutely beautiful. It, it, it makes so much sense. Having studied many of the socks in embedded systems and IoT systems, I, I, this is it's beautiful that you can control all the silicon, the, what they've done with it to improve battery life, uh, control the ecosystem, control their costs. Um, it's just and, is fabulous. And, However, and, it's and, ARM. And have, and have one of the most uh, advanced architectures I from agree. Uh, the construction process and yeah. speed uh, that blows everything else out of the water. At Absolutely. This point. The problem is it's ARM. The problem with that is most of your applications are expected uh, x86 instruction set, which means they're going to have to put a politician on every single system. And that is right. something on every single system that's going to lie to all of your applications and tell it, oh, I understand your the instruction set, and I'll just convert that into the back end into a different instruction set and then lie back to you again with the response. Mm -hmm. And in my yep. experience, they call that Rosetta. Yeah, um, but uh, that, the, new, the, new one, the new one is Rosetta 2. Yeah, um, and, and, and that's and, supposed to solve all of the problems. I just... Didn't maybe I'm, maybe I'm older and curmudgeonly right with, now. Uh, this is going to be problematic one. for everyone who's, I think, security professionals specifically that are on the Mac platform. I encourage you, come to the dark side. Come to Linux. Tyler made a great recommendation on, on hardware. Doug White and I talk about how we can build PC hardware that's absolutely ridiculous for a fraction of the cost of a Mac. And Ubuntu 2004 runs spectacular i have to say i don't have any like more or less problems than i did with windows or, or mac os now i don't spend a lot of time recompiling my kernel and that's not like the old days like things are way better now if you get good pc based hardware and you're on ubuntu has done a great job 24 i think is great they're trying to get me to go to 2010 and i'm not falling for it this time guys i'm not no, falling don't. for it i'm on long-term support 2004 you've done a great job with that with that release i'm sticking with it not don't fall for the trap. It's like you know when click the update button. Yeah, when they you know Lucy removes the no. football or whatever, and, and Charlie Brown. Like I'm not falling do for it. This do time. it. You know you want to. So do it. so Paul, here here's here's my thing, and that um, I, I actually tried. I, I didn't want to buy any Mac. I didn't want to pay the Apple tax not that long ago, uh, and I bought a Chromebook to try mm -hmm. to do Linux on the desktop, and mm -hmm. I you know put Linux on the Chromebook, and I didn't care about the speed. I just wanted to see what was available to me to be able to use, a and for me, um, uh, the command line thing, did, yeah, Linux, great, no big deal. But when I came to graphical apps that I wanted to use and the way I wanted to use them. The apps that I used under Linux for the things that I wanted to do all, pardon my French, they fucking sucked. <laughs> uh, like, yeah, Twitter, uh, I, I like the desktop client. I can't deal with that in-browser bullcrap. Uh, no, I want I... the full desktop client. Like, some of the stuff that I was using just was horrible. Um, oh, uh, and for me, that was the deal breaker for Linux mm. on the desktop. Um, as opposed to something like Windows or Mac OS. Yeah, I I, I don't know. I kind of I, I don't no, really I, care. I, I don't care so much about the Twitter. Itself. You know, the the graphical applications. I've gotten used to a lot of the browser based ones. Specifically, that was Larry Twitter and an RSS reader, and I found browser based mm -hmm. alternatives, and those work largely. A lot of other Linux applications are are just fine, especially Electron has been great in providing that unified experience. So things like Spotify, Signal, uh, Zoom, Skype, Slack, it all work totally fine uh, on Linux in my experience. I, I think so we've, here's, we've here's kind of been on this route though, right? Like with Windows 8.1 RT, which was ARM-based, right? They yep. try to move to that ecosystem. Yep. And I think 
the general public and the general user experience, the people that are going to use iOS and Mac OS, like these people are not going to care whether it's on ARM or not, if their apps work, like they don't care about the the security and the in-between agent that's going to have to happen. I think this is going to be a big security shift. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think enterprise shift. I think there's going to be a lot of enterprises that are looking at it, but it also offers some management that uh, enterprises, I think we'll see more solutions from an enterprise level start to interact or have access to, or maybe even there's some commercial applications that do ad tracking and, and uh, you know, commercialized stuff that sends your personal data out from this particular, you know, agent or middleware. There's a lot of things that are going to kind of change in that ecosystem very quickly. Yeah, I think I think it's Apple's version of the the Chromebook essentially because all your apps that are available in the Apple App Store now are going to run natively. That's a huge win for Apple. Most of it is a win for Apple and most of the right. Apple the Apple user base. I think for the for lack of a better term, the power users they're going to basically diverge and they're going to leave the, in my, this is my prediction, they're going to leave the Apple platform. They're going to go towards Windows, which in Windows subsystem for Linux in the next couple of versions, you're going to get a full graphical interface on Windows running with Linux running on top of it natively. And I think so people are going to go that route or they're going to go native Linux. And I, I, I and think... And PowerShell for Linux running inside of your... And Bash the other way around too, ice. yeah. It's so, I, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. And, so, and I, I have a little bit different take on it in that you know I've been using the the Raspberry Pi architecture for so long, which is ARM based, and you know I I think there's so much out there that for for ARM platform security wise from just the advent of uh, you know, everybody using the small single board computers, I don't think it's going to be that huge of a deal for some of the power users. Yeah, but it, I, except I really when don't. you get into the enterprise, though, your enterprise level software does not support ARM on Raspberry Pi and yeah. does not support some of the Chromebooks also are ARM based and there's no support for Chrome, but even x86 Chromebooks, there's no support for them, let alone ARM. Uh, and I've experienced that with patching solutions and other things. They just they don't support that platform because it's not prevalent in the enterprise. If you're tinkering around at home, Larry, I completely agree. I think yep. Raspberry Pi with ARM has come has come a long way, but you still run into that one package that you're like, oh, that hasn't been compiled on the ARM platform, right? Agreed. So, Agreed. And and I think maybe that's the superpower user that's more apt to be down that road. And yeah. I get what you're saying about the power user sort of in the enterprise. Um, and admittedly, it's not going to be something that's going to happen overnight. I think it will be fine. I'm I, I'm guessing. I, I don't know. But uh, I think it was probably in Apple's best interest to do it just mm-hmm. because they... Yeah. I, I argue they're the, now the leading processor manufacturer in the world above Intel and AMD. And Yeah, you know. they've done a great job. Although I have to tell you, though, if you're specking out some new machines and you're looking at AMD, holy crap, the Ryzen 9 5900X 12-core processor is absolutely amazing. And then you couple that. So like my next build, would I go buy a brand new Mac or would I build something on my own? And when Doug White and I were talking... I'm specking out in the AMD latest processor, which in all the benchmarks is actually ahead of, of Intel in some of the benchmarks that I've, I've read. You couple that with the new 3000 series from NVIDIA, which is packing a huge amount of processing power in uh, in those GPUs at a fraction of the cost of what they have on the market today, which is amazing. You can build some serious some serious hardware. Uh, and and I, that, I, I, that's where absolutely. I see power. You, if you're a power user, man, you got to look at that stuff. I mean, if you don't no, think you need 128 absolutely. gigs of RAM, uh, you need 120 gigs of RAM is what I'm saying. <laughs> see, and I think oh, that's yeah. where that's where the difference in kind of your market and what, what the different companies are marketing to, right? Like you've got that high performance, low cost uh, power user that the AMD has always kind of mm-hmm. been – marketing Mm -hmm. to and then intel's big thing is like they've always kind of led that high performance high cost but on the alternative side of that their security designs like i was just going to say that i think you talked last week about intel security architecture and that that would be one reason why i would pay the extra and and, and stick with intel hardware enhanced threat detection Mm -hmm. um intel's uh, what do they call intel uh tdt Mm -hmm. 
um, that that is providing a ton that's going to have some huge ramifications as soon as like the OSs start to catch up and hardware starts so, to catch up. You know, up to Microsoft's going to gonna be the, the first do. one. Microsoft's going to be the first one to catch up with that. The Apple's they left already, the Intel chip now, it. so that chip is sailed. Linux is open source and it's weird, but Microsoft will try and support it the best it can, but um, or Intel maybe, who knows. But I think that Microsoft Intel partnership is very strong and they're both pushing forward on security. And, and for an enterprise play or power user that really cares about security like we do, that that could be a valid option. Yeah, and they've already yeah. built that in. The next the next kernel version is going to have that integrated. It's going to have like the memory scanning all available at the hardware level at the chip. So just like said at the um, hardware hard drive encryption, where you know all the data going in and out is all encrypted and it's encrypted and unencrypted on the fly, and the chip handles that overhead, it makes it almost a no-performance hit. That's that's huge. Mm -hmm. Same thing for some of Giant. the memory scanning, the exploit detection, um, firmware validation, and even up into the cloud where your keys are stored in a, in a TPM, mm -hmm. and the, the scanning and TPM pieces integrate directly to the circuits on the processor right. that that's then the does Azure encryption Sphere component. in the cloud. Is that that's Azure Sphere component coming to more commodity-based hardware outside of IoT? That would make sense yes. for Microsoft. Yep. Yeah. Love it. Yep. Wow. That was some wow. nerdy stuff. Let's stick with nerdy stuff. <laughs> DNS <laughs> cash poisoning. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The internet attack from 2008 is back from the dead. And after your nerdy one, I got a nerdy one. Absolutely. Let's keep it nerdy. Back, um, back so, from what year? Uh, 2008 is when Dan Kaminsky presented, I believe it was at Black Hat, um, okay. about DNS cash poisoning in the feasibility uh, of that attack. They recap uh, that attack in this article and then basically talk about a new attack that, so the remediation for the Dan Kaminsky attack, for lack of a better term, right, was to randomize the port number. So mm -hmm. there's a, an, an S, SI, SID, a, an identifier associated with your DNS requests and responses. And it, it turns out that space for that was was weak and enough spoofed responses you could exhaust that space and get the dns server to cache the response that was sending google.com to my ip address right basically is the dan Kaminsky attack so what they did to remediate that was they said well dns normally talks over destination and source port 53 let's then include a new port in that communication and randomize that to a different port and what the researchers found with this new attack was that uh, through some things with uh, rate limiting as to which ports are open and which are not with your ICMP responses being, uh, I think Linux uh, said that it was a, a thousand responses per second and then it would stop responding. They were able to basically construct an attack where they could derive what port you moved to and derive uh, the ID to get your spoofed response in. Um, you, you have to go read the article because that wasn't the best description that, that I provided all, all off the cuff. But uh, that's basically the gist of it. Did anyone else read the article and digest some of this? I was reading some of the paper earlier, and mm. it, a lot of it seemed to have to do with which DNS server you're interacting with and their ability and rate limit that then come into play, which is kind of where the side channel comes into it, right? Right, that it's a side channel me. attack because they're they're looking at the ICMP responses, and the ICMP will respond that hey, this port isn't open. But if you don't get one of those, that means that port is open, and that's the port that the DNS server and the authoritative DNS server have basically agreed upon to communicate for those responses. Now you know the port. The next part is basically going back to 2008. Looking at Dan Kaminsky's research and deriving that ID to go, I've got a valid response, and this is the one, not the real one, essentially. Yeah, and with with modern hardware and like cloud support mm -hmm. with something like Lambda, where you're doing you know a whole bunch of requests and and maybe randomizing those across different IPs, you can derive a lot of information quickly. So I think this actually may become more of an issue in in the future, just Agreed. as speed speed increases. This is. Fairly novel from that standpoint, but there's also not a lot of people looking at this, which is also interesting because IPv6 would probably fix this just based on the way IPv6 works, mm -hmm. and you're not going to be able to exhaust that port list uh, in the same way. Cloudflare also introduced a fix of its own, and they say in certain cases, DNS will fall back to TCP, 
which of course is a lot more difficult to spoof. Back to your point of as the infrastructure improves and response times improves, we could likely use TCP, maybe not in all cases, but flip to it and go, eh, something wonky is going on. I want to switch to TCP. I wonder if um, I wonder if any of the DNS sec stuff would address the way in which this is handled too. And Kaminsky was big on DNS sec. He was a huge proponent of that. Which there makes wasn't, me, there makes wasn't me a, think. I don't know why that didn't take off. I remember I remember looking at that and and mm -hmm. reading about it back in what was it oh four oh five, yep. and it never really never really yeah it never really no, went think, anywhere. I think it was just because it was fairly difficult to implement. Just, I agree, Larry. I was going to say the same thing. Yeah. Because it required, you know, that whole, you know, circle of trust, and then you had to, you know, how how many people sign other people's PGP keys pre-COVID, like early this year? Yeah, what? It's interesting. Yeah, right? it was kind of like that. Thing. What happened to PGP key signing parties? Now with COVID, of course. I mean, I think the last Today. one was at your your wedding reception, Paul. You're right. Like. <laughs> It was still one of the most efficient and effective security controls that I can think of that I still don't see a ton of people use. Hmm. Like they get all hey. fancy and have to use something, you know, well outside of the, the parameters that simple PGP and, you know, key signing could fix as far as communications go. <laughs> but that takes work and effort. Mm -hmm. And Tyler, Dimitri is asking, wouldn't DNSSEC mitigate the cash poison attacks? Yeah, I believe so. Uh, I think That's, so. Thinking through how that would work, I don't think this would play into it, especially with the the communication and, and the handoff. That's not going to – you're not going to be able to derive the same information uh, quickly enough. Larry, you said you had another nerdy story. Yeah. Yeah. So it was nerdy for me anyways, and that was the uh, zebras and dots yeah, uh, I like the story. Uh, story that you mentioned the, in, the, in the beginning of the show. Paul. Mm. Uh, and this one was from uh, Dr. Neil Krawitz. Oh. Um, love yeah, love so. that we're hearing from Neil. He is one of those people that puts out these uh, posts that it almost automatically deserves some kind of coverage because it's just exactly. so interesting. Exactly. And for me, this one was like, so I'm a big fan of the, you know, the, the OPSEC and the research of finding data where you never really would expect data that's said. Yeah, and that's interest. what Neil's uh, yeah. Hacker Factor blog is. Uh, HackerFactor.com is all about, right? Yeah, yeah. And he's done a ton of image analysis, you mm -hmm. know, near and dear to my heart for some of the XF metadata stuff. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, we were you know, we were discussing stuff way back in the day on, on some of that stuff. Um, but uh, he published uh, one where he was tired of watching – tired of watching the news about all the election stuff here in the u.s and uh decided to just focus on, on something else and he uh he spent some time over a week or so looking at some barcodes um, and understanding what barcodes were all made up of and all that type of stuff and specifically looking at um the data matrix 2d barcode stuff uh, and finding that it was on everyone, everything, and it's likely used in manufacturing a lot. Uh, yeah, he's got one on an uh, AMD Ryzen 5 3600X, good yep. processor. Like yep. that. Pro and, and, I, I, I never noticed that there was a barcode, uh, a 3D barcode on on those. Pro yep. I guess I get so and excited he, when I build a computer. I, I just I, I missed yeah, that. And, and he decoded it and it matched the numbers that were printed on the the the, the Ryzen processor as mm -hmm. well. And you know, wasn't really sure what it was for, but it is likely something that was used in the the mechanization and the automation of the the packaging and or all of that process because it's something that a machine can read. Mm. Then he got into one specifically for postage stamps and the uh two by two um postage stamp um barcodes were absolutely fascinating uh especially when you're printing your own postage from like a postage machine that you may mm -hmm. have in your home or your business and uh, and that type of stuff and that you know, some interesting analysis that he was finding just from looking at those barcodes. Uh, for example, um, he was finding that every uh, bill that he received from his landscaper that was a small business, um, you could tell the interval for how many things were being mailed because the barcode said you're, uh, you know, he gets the bill for November, uh, and uh, it was at position one, and he gets a bill for December, and it's at position 934. And he expected for a small business that they wouldn't have 933 other customers. Mm. 
um, some of the other barcode formats that he was finding um, has uh, some information about how much postage that that device has actually printed. Like one of them he found uh, that um, uh, was so one of the large bulk mail corporate man mailings he found f- decoded and found that a bulk mailer had spent a million dollars on just that one postage printing machine and that they had a remaining prepaid balance of over $90,000 hmm. because it was all encoded in the barcode for the, the prepaid printing stamp thing. Like what? <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I like your assessment that of that though. It's like finding data where you, you normally wouldn't expect to find data. And what does that tell yeah. you? Yeah, and what what things can we derive from that, and what mm-hmm. inferences can we make, and you know what does that tell us about their business? And in this uh, case, inco- clearly, I mean, that could be incorporated in some of your pretext uh, in social engineering. Yeah, right? exactly. Now, what you just said, like now you know what machine they have, how much they spent on it, how much they print. Maybe I call them up and say, "Hey, I got a, a cheaper machine that can save you money on your on your postage, right?" Yep. Oh, and, roughly and, 90, and not even 90, that. And clearly, that their their business is a is a valuable business and is profitable because they spent a million dollars in postage. Or it's a poorly run business and they spent a million dollars. Wow. Yeah. From a business competitive analysis and you know maybe even corporate espionage or mm. competitive analysis for that matter, like there's a bunch you could utilize that for. I I could see, like outside of just offense, like hey, you're. You're uh, at ninety thousand. We need to do maintenance on your barcode and and printer because uh, it shows here you're you're about to be up for your maintenance renewal. Like there's a ton you could do there too, but mm-hmm. I could see this being like from a merger and acquisition standpoint, or even prior to going public, uh, just gaining interesting information that other places because anybody can do you know internet OSINT. And find information on stuff, but this is kind of a unique way to gather stuff that maybe might not show in the books, might not show online, might not even show by uh, revenue numbers. So, or you really could have your your source code leaked or not leaked. I it, and I I think Ooh. I I did misspeak uh, about that, Tyler, because it was decompiled. Correct. Right, because you went from object code in Java. A jar file is more like object code. Um, into source code, and it was uh, essentially that means decompile. It different with yep. Java and, than and traditional C uh, languages in, in in that respect. But basically, you went from the object code in Java to uh, source code, which is not the same as your source code leaking. Right, and I think we're missing a little context on that one, Paul. Uh, oh, because so Cobalt Strike, it. yeah. The, I mean, the headlines <laughs> read that Cobalt Strike. I don't know which story of mine that was. Cobalt Strike source code had been leaked and posted to GitHub. Uh, yeah, and, and honestly, the, 13. Yeah, my the story publicity around this and the way in which this was kind of sourced and, and Twitterfied uh, was, you know, it wasn't fair t- to Rafi. I had a, mm. a pretty good chat with Rafi the other night. Uh, it was actually last night. And, I mean, his, his code and his software has always had that uh, possibility. It's a it's a jar file. It's been decompiled. Uh, there's been places where they've cracked it. In fact, he wrote an entire blog post on how he would go about cracking his own software if he were a bad guy because someone had posted something similar to this mm-hmm. uh, a couple years back. So really, the fact that someone decompiled this, this is not someone got on his laptop. This is not, you know, there was a breach. Uh, someone took what was available uh, a Cobalt Strike uh, install, and and he does offer trials, but he's very good about vetting the people that he offers trials to, and or places that he sells to, and he's always done that. And so they took it, decompiled it, fixed all the dependencies, fixed any of the uh, errors with inside the code, and then commented out the the licensing. <laughs> That's license check. Yeah, yeah but so. I, I but I think first of all, Raphael Mudge, Rafi is an outstanding person, upstanding citizen in our community, uh, the utmost respect. His company was acquired by Help HelpNet Systems, which is also the company that acquired uh, Core Security. Mm-hmm. I think I think Rafi's kind of like, I'm gonna make a great product, and if people are gonna rip it off, people are gonna rip it off and and, and use it, right? I'm still gonna make a, a, a great product, and that that seems to be the the. T- I don't think Rafi went out of his way 
to make sure that no one could decompile it and, and, and distribute it, right? I don't think that was his focus. His focus was to make great software. Let's, let's be frank. A lot of great attack tools, defensive tools, are open source, and everyone can see the source, and, and, and that's okay. And I think this is where Rafi falls on that. I think Core Security put a lot more effort into trying to protect that framework, and that's not to say that people haven't cracked it either, but they put a lot more effort into that to reduce the number of instances. You can never get it to zero. Attackers are always going to have... So if it's software and it's out there, there is likely, more than likely, an, an attacker group or nation state that has obtained a copy, yep. has reverse engin engineered. That is just table stakes now in the days of the mm -hmm. internet yep. in, in nation state attacks. Yep. And Rafi's always been a, a programmer of one. Like, uh, yeah. uh, even up until very recently, um, he's done... He's been very close hold to to kind of the source code and like the quality of what he produces and mm -hmm. the price point reflects that he doesn't right. you know he doesn't take money he doesn't have you know big marketing behind any of it it just is here's a great product here's how it works here's what we've used it for and the industry is built you know we've built an industry around some of the tooling that he's done but like you said when he was saying stuff it was it's open source to an extent anyway. There, it's very modular. It's very right. compatible to do <clears throat> scripting. And there's a ton of tools out there that utilize a lot of the same techniques uh, that are freely available. So really this doesn't provide any more or less um, capability to the offense, which is a, what a bunch of the Twitter people were complaining about. Again, offensive tools leaking, offensive tools going to be used for, you know, bad nefarious things like oh, come there's on. plenty of tools I mean, out there all right doing so that rafi might as well just open source at this point and we'd all respect him for that because i go on github and search for exploits that is, that's where people are posting exploits today and the source code's freely available and guess what before that there was millworm then we go back <laughs> yep. i mean jeff in your day where did you get exploits from you traded with your friends maybe you're on bbs's maybe there were websites or other way this is a we commodity. Had, we thing. had uh, mostly FTP servers that yeah. were called wares servers. Right, exactly, exactly. This has always been a commodity or, or, thing. Or if you're Paul, you called them Juarez servers. Juarez. But <laughs> yeah, and and Paul, the the thing that I think about the this the fascinating about the Cobalt Strike thing is that you and I were there from to observe the inception. Mm. Yes. Because uh, he was involved with in CCDC. Events. Yeah, Rafi built that yeah. because of Mid Atlantic CCDC and yeah. because that no one could coordinate their sessions and and all of this type of stuff from the red team and it was totally frustrating. So he wrote something to solve that right. problem. Yeah. Uh, Talk about vouching for someone. I mean, like we've known player Metasploit, right? We've known Rafi for a, a long time. Long time. Always. Yeah. His intent has always been genuine and and good. Yeah. So yep. there you Absolutely. have it. Um, yep. uh, <clears throat> where do we go from there? I, some, hey, some, other stories? From Lee. Lee? From yeah, Lee. Lee. I agree. Oh, okay. I was just looking at one of your other stories, and I was thinking... Um, so. I don't care if it's from you or if it's a, yeah, a, a story you want to talk about, any, Lee. Any story, I was Lee. looking at Paul's story uh, 17 about the mysterious bugs used to the act, ha hack iPhones and Androids, because last week we were talking about the t the three zero days against the late, that iOS 14.2 resolved. Oh, this and and, like, that's a great narrative. What the thing. heck? You picked a, a huh? you picked a golden nugget, right? Because uh, we talked about <clears throat> excuse me, zero days in Chrome. There was three. There's two new ones. We'll get to those in a moment. But now there's also this article from Vice, which is pa painting a picture. And I guess I'm a conspiracy theorist at heart. And there were a flurry of high impact vulnerabilities: Chrome, Android, Windows, and iOS, actively exploited in the wild. And people were using these. Basically, what they're saying is this is likely the same group or a group that is using these exploits in conjunction with each other. Interesting. Some of the other intelligence that I'm gathering is that there's a, a combination of attacks happening. Some of the more recent right. public attacks and maybe not so public attacks are using this combination of, of threats, of vulnerabilities, and of, of tactics and techniques, right? I guess we've always used a combination, but it's becoming more commonplace. I, I, I think it, it, it does represent somewhat of a paradigm shift because previously you may have one good zero day exploit and before like, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, that was enough. I, I could accomplish a lot. If I had a zero day for something, hey, let's say like bind DNS, right? I could be highly effective. 
But I think we've evolved uh, in terms of defense, in terms of complexity of our networks that stringing these together, as this article that, that you picked Lee points out, where I need attack vectors, paths into, I need maybe some browser exploits, I need some mobile exploits, I gotta do some email phishing, and maybe that email phishing is made better by some SMS and some social uh, network uh, communications as well to make that story more believable, to make my attack vectors more believable. In the story I think we talked about last week on multiple shows was I've got yeah. some open redirects and some really popular reputable domains coupled with I've got some Chrome zero days coupled with I've built some infrastructure to be able to send those attacks. And, and this is what we're up against uh, today. Right. Well, I, part of it has got to be that we're seeing more and more cross-platform code use. You know, when you see the iOS 14 update come out, you're not only seeing your iPhones, but you're seeing an op update for the watch, yep. the, the Mac, the Apple TV, et cetera, et cetera. The browser and of same Safari. Same thing with the, with the Android OS. It's, it's cross-platform and same with Chrome. And I think that's one of the interesting side effects is you've got the same code running on multiple platforms. If it's got a vulnerability, it's a field day if you happen to find it first. Yeah, they talk about font, I'm not font vulnerabilities them for code in here. reuse. Yeah, font vulnerability, font libraries. And, and to your point, Lee, that that's reused in multiple platforms, and you could exploit they, the they same. They said that they're very targeted too. Like, there's some interesting things that are not said, or or yeah. in between the lines here. Yeah. And the, the target exploitation right. found in the wild that's patched all the way back to six really means that the there's a reason that they're patching it back to there, and there's a pretty notable reason that they seen this somehow. Uh, and are now having to fix this all the way back to there. That's uh, that highly targeted means that it was used to find someone to do something. So I'm curious who that was and why that was you leveraged. Think, you think it's the same anonymous folks that reported the zero days in Chrome? Nope. So the the uh, so there was three now, uh, last week and in previous weeks. Now there's two. Google patches two more Chrome zero days. These two bugs right. mark the fourth and fifth zero days that Google has patched in Chrome over three weeks. The difference this time is that the first three zero days were discovered internally by Google security researchers. These two new zero days came to Google's Very attention nice. after tips from, I'm going to put air quotes, anonymous sources. <clears throat> it was government. And these two new ones are uh, just government? Descri or a, a, a government. <laughs> A could, government, yeah. I mean, we could speculate. That's the beautiful thing about the show is we can speculate um, and, and have our conspiracy theories. And I, I think some evidence does support. When I see, uh, come on, anonymous sources, like really, like you is do you really think we're that naive that we're going to believe it was an anonymous source that reported zero days? That there, if it wasn't someone who wanted to obscure their identity, wouldn't they want to collect their bug bounty payment? That's mm -hmm. so that to me, I'm calling bullshit on that. Yep. And, um, so that uh, sounds, that sounds like a government that needs to patch something that they seen and were being either targeted with or using and no longer have a use for. Oh, yeah. Like targeting executives for <coughs> C level executives on international companies. Yep. E either either bug bounty program or sell to on the black market or yeah why sell it, right why would you anonymously or, yeah. report it to Google you uh, look if you're an evil bad person you're gonna sell that to a nation state somewhere or I mean maybe you're not an evil bad person and you're gonna sell those I there, there's lots of different schools of thoughts about there and the, we blur the lines with morals and in ethics uh, someone might do it I have it might I might as well sell it and monetize that I, you know i there's a lot that, that's a whole segment in of itself to be honest with you um, <laughs> right but well, the morals well, and it, ethics are, are around selling zero day exploits is is really an, an entire uh, topic in and of itself now to paul to segue to a teeny bit um one of the stories oh, i had sorry in one last point my story uh, number eight so, uh, before we get there, I just wanted to say yeah. there were uh, two new CVEs that were released. One is described as uh, inappropriate implementation in V8. V8 is the JavaScript engine that is used by Google's Chrome browser. All f four browsers, Opera, Firefox, Safari, and Chrome, use different, uh, different code, uh, largely different code bases and different implementations of the JavaScript engine, which is one pathway to uh, exploiting the browser. 
And um, they also describe a use after free memory corruption bug in site isolation. This is the component that can re creates basically different sandboxes for each tab, right? So there's the, the browser engine, which creates these tabs. There's the rendering engine, which is a different piece of code. Then there's the JavaScript renderer, which is yet a different piece of code. All that code is different across all these browsers. My assessment of this was that some folks have been reading Taman Park's um, no jitsu locking down JavaScript engines from his uh, Black Hat uh, 2020 presentation, where Taman describes uh, this in research papers and presentations from Black Hat, which I believe, and I interviewed Taman in our Security Weekly Virtual Hacker Summer Camp, I believe nation states, vulnerability researchers uh, have been paying attention to his research and using that and now we have all these new i don't think it's a coincidence that Taman presented on this and now we're seeing all of these uh vulnerabilities and exploits being uncovered in well google chrome and, and other browsers as well in the javascript rendering engine i don't think that's a coincidence at all yeah so on the ethical disclosure thing paul on a, on a little bit of a, a tangent um, my story, I think it was number uh, eight uh, on the unlimited chase card, uh, ultimate rewards points. Um, uh, this particular person uh, found something that was a problem in 2016 and just finally chose to disclose it because of fear of retaliation. Uh, but they found that there were some race conditions within the balance transfer stuff for some chase bank cards. Um, effectively meaning that, um, you know, based on that race condition, they could generate, they could do multiple balance transfers and uh, increase the number of points that they had because of those balance transfers. Uh, and on one account, they ended up with a huge negative uh, balance of these rewards points and a huge positive balance, like in the five millions, which was uh, $70,000 plus in U.S. travel dollars. Uh, because of a, a race condition. Were they so uh, they were transferring points, figuring out a way they, to they, hack the system to transfer no, credit they card were, points? The, the intent was they were intending to do a balance transfer to a card that was of lower interest rate. Yep. So they were doing the balance transfer from one card to another. They Their internet connection died during that. The balance transfer went through. They got new points, but it really didn't go through. So they tried uh, it again, race and it condition. worked, and yep. they got double the points. Yep, yep. And, and you know, doing it multiple times with that scenario, they got five million plus points. So they're getting the points without incurring the full balance. Right. Exactly. Yeah. They so they reached out to Chase, and Chase said, "Can you tell us more? How, what do you do?" Uh, so he saw that as permission. Um, went and canceled the account with the negative five million points, and it, the negative five million points were gone. Mm -hmm. But he still had the account with the five million points. Um, use their system to prove that he could transfer those points out uh, for cash uh, and transferred $5,000 out in points in cash uh, into a yes. checking account uh, and then followed up with support. It's like, like you asked for more proof. Here's the proof. Mm -hmm. I canceled the account. The negative points are gone. I still have the 5 million point, 5 million points worth $79,000. I can book air travel, but I decided to withdraw five thousand dollars in cash uh, for those points, um, and um, you know, I'd really it'd be, I'd be good if you fix this. And uh, my estimation is that you can have the five thousand dollars back. I'll give it to you. Um, and their response was, "Okay, cool, we'll fix it." And then canceled all of his and his family's accounts. Mm. Interesting. Now this was four years ago, mm -hmm. and he Ooh. finally did. They they finally decided to. Uh, uh, Chad finally decided to uh, acknowledge and and report it. Uh, mm. So that's a dick move. Yeah. And if you that want hackers to really not like you and screw you over, don't do dick moves like that. Yeah, because yeah. I wonder if his credit was affected because of all that. I, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, um, I mean, he posted that the technology, the the technical part a day ago. Um, so like. You talk about responsible disclosure. He did the right thing. He disclosed. He sent everything. They didn't have the appropriate disclosure stuff four years ago, which is still mind-boggling. Yeah, but that's a that's um, a slippery slope, Larry. I mean, one could say now. Look, I, I'm on the side of the hacker in this in in this case because there, when I look at these cases, I look at intent. This person, from what you described, Larry, their intent was absolutely genuine and good. 
he was trying to get them to fix the issue so that other people couldn't commit fraud. But to prove right. that you could commit fraud, he had to commit fraud. Mm -hmm. And this is why I always recommend you have a really good lawyer on, <laughs> on, on, you know, on your side. Because essentially he did commit fraud to prove you commit fraud and he could be prosecuted for fraud uh, in, right. in this case. However, yeah. again, I'm on the side of the hacker. His intent was purely genuine and good. Uh, yep. For and, the protection and, of and others, I'd and I'd argue, even though he committed fraud, he technically, and as he saw it, and based away, I'm reading the message, um, he had permission. Right. Yes. Right. But yeah, but that's I, so, then you get into so lawyers Lee, and Lee. courts and and all that stuff, and it can be a slippery slope. Yeah. Lee, come in. So I was saying he had permission, but he, did he have permission from the right level? I mean, mm -hmm. it seems and, like. That's a, they yeah. detected what he did, and their normal fraud stuff just shut him down, closed his account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is what it's supposed to do. Agreed. The, a lot of that stuff is automated, for sure. Yeah. And uh, and it might not be the size of institution either, because they a smaller institution is going to buy an automated fraud system that's going to take care of stuff. So you, you definitely have to make sure the person giving you permission really can. And like Paul said, a good lawyer on your side is pretty damn important. Especially when you're dealing with financial institutions and oh yeah, alleged fraud. Yes. Oh yeah. Um. Oh wait, there was something. Oh, the term "threat intelligence" is poisoned. Was the headline? The headline, rather. Um, it doesn't mean what you think it means, according to the article's title. I took out the snippet, like, really, and this is, it seems like this is a sponsored article. Um, actually, my, my time at, at, at Cyber Risk Alliance, I'm getting to learn how some of this media stuff uh, uh, works in terms of sponsored articles. Uh, and this was uh, written by someone who does work for a threat intelligence vendor. In, in this case, I'll call them out. It was written by Threat Caution. And I, I don't think what the person, Mark Solomon was the author I, I, li I like what Mark was saying. I, th I thought he'd bring up a, a valid point, but I, I think it can be consolidated. Uh, the, the takeaway is in, in the quote that I put in the show notes, and that is threat intelligence is... Uh, so uh, Mark did a great job because he quoted Gartner and how Gartner defines threat intelligence and then challenged that notion. I think that's what really made me like this article. And so Gartner defines it, threat intelligence as evidence-based knowledge, including context mechanisms, indicators, implications, and action-oriented advice about how an existing or emerging menace or hazard to assets that can be used to inform decisions regarding the subject's response to that menace or hazard. Wow. That is some word smithing there. That is just beautiful. That was a thousand dollar sentence, buddy. Right? At least. It, so, but I, I, what I, what Mark I think is picking on is, they say including context. What, what does that mean? Con context in what? Context in what context? Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of interesting. So, um, he says, you know, many equate this definition to external sources of threat data, and this is how I've described threat intelligence in the past. It's shit that's happening on other people's networks. That's not what's yeah. happening on my networks. The context piece. And what Mark says, and I largely agree with, is that the context is that correlation between what's happening on other people's networks to what might be happening on, on my networks. And what are the, the correlations and parallels between the two? And that's really how you get threat intelligence done. And I think it was a very uh, a stark reminder of how to use threat intelligence data that context is not... The context of how it's happening in other people's networks is the context how it relates to what may or may be happening in my network that may be the same or similar to what happens in other people's networks. So I, I think the big the big key thing to focus on for threat intelligence is <clears throat> based on your maturity and what you're trying to get out of it. There's a difference mm. between a threat feed yes. and threat analysis and threat intelligence. Agreed. Threat intelligence is utilizing threat intel, which is the data, and having someone that's smart enough to correlate, put those pieces together, and provide it to you in a context that actually matters to your network. And that's kind of the big piece that's missing that can't be really automated. You can do that for specific verticals. You can do that for uh, particular attacks. But really, 
threat intelligence and getting threat intelligence right requires the analysis piece and analysis done right based on good data, good data being the key, uh, will provide you some value, but that also requires you to be a much more mature organization. And, and not just correlating against one external source and one internal source, multiple on both fronts <laughs> is what helps you tell the story. The best threat analysts that I know never rely on one external source and one internal source. They use multiple external sources to start to tell a story. Then they take the great pieces from those threat feeds and they go to their internal sources and they correlate those together. And that complex matrix requires automation and to your point, Tyler, a, a skilled analyst to put all those pieces together. Right. Yep, pulling on those threads of, of good data and really the the ability of a company to acquire that good data, and whether yeah. that's through you know good partnerships or, or very advanced data collection or good data and good like, talent is, is the winning combination. Yeah. There, right? It, 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 yep. It's what uh, some of my friends will do is get ahead of physical threats because they can put all those uh, os and uh, pieces together and go that bank branch is in a tricky spot and it's likely that there's going to be a you know rioting and looting in that area evacuate and board that shit up immediately and they've actually saved branches by doing right. exactly what Tyler and I are describing in threat intelligence is putting all those pieces it's an investigation and putting all those pieces together which does require threat feeds it requires good internal intelligence and the automation to put that together and an, an actual person to uh, oversee that process Yep. That's why the Secret Service is so good. They have good data. Yeah. They've got no, good I, people. It's, you're right. And they have amazing analytical minds. It, it, it's that predictive. Right. It, what really AI and machine learning technology, as I'm discovering, is if it's really implemented well on all those different levels, allows you to predict and get ahead of those threats. That's that's really where I, I see value. Reacting right. to what happened. Yeah, you can use AI and machine learning to tell you like what what happened after the fact. That's not anyone can analyze logs and tell you what happened after the fact. I don't need AI or machine learning. The value there to me is that predictive aspect to it. Well, but there's also there's also the piece of you know you get this threat intel that you know for example, all the APTs are are going after uh, vulnerable remote access services. It wouldn't be a bad idea to make sure your remote access services are are, are vulnerable or not, whether or not you feel you're threatened to the APTs or an APT target. You got to look to the the pragmatic as well. You know, oh, what are, what are, what's being exploited? Yeah. Do and, I do I have that particular vulnerability in in my right. environment? And do I think the other question that I think is almost more important: Do I have the processes in place? to detect that vulnerability in my environment so that I can take in a threat feed and correlate the two to your point, Lee. Hell yeah. Right. If uh, I know that I've got attack surface management processes and technology right. and people in place to go. Yes. I know what my external exposure is when the threat feed comes in and says threat actors are going after this remote access protocol. I can say with uh, almost a hundred percent accuracy because I don't think you ever really get to hundred percent. Almost 100 percent accuracy. Enough. I don't. I don't. I don't. That attack path is is not valid in our environment, and I can prove it. Right. It's sort of a sort of a reality check of what's going on. Get your get your head up above the the fence and look around. Mm -hmm. But yeah, relevance and context. <laughs> uh, back to Linux security for a little bit. Uh, how to get root on Ubuntu 2004 by pretending nobody's slash home. Love this article. What? Uh, for a lot of reasons, I just love this article. Um, <clears throat> the reason I love this article, I, well, I mean, the, the tech is cool. Uh, it, it's very, it's a well-written article, but it, it basically, this happened by accident. This was a security researcher that was like, you know, I was looking into these denial of service vulnerabilities, closed the lid on my laptop. Later, I opened it up and realized I was locked out of my account. In recovering my account, I created a new terminal TTY session on, on Control Alt F4, right? For those that have been around Linux or Unix for a while, I'll create you a new TTY session. Opened up the console, logged in, and <clears throat> killed the resulting process. Then when I logged back in, basically Ubuntu asked me if I wanted to create a new account. 
when I went to go create a new account, I could create an administrative or root uh, privileged account on the system. All the technical details are there and laid out uh, for you to go review. I think the, the, the series of vulnerabilities is the first interesting thing, that it wasn't just one vulnerability. It was a series of vulnerabilities that were exploited, as we've talked about, those lower level vulnerabilities, such as denial of service. Basically, one of the vulnerabilities this researcher found was they could make the CPU go to 100% and cause a denial of service on the, on the machine. But that was used in conjunction with some other tricks that are described in the article to be able to create a new uh, privileged root level account, making it go from denial of service to privilege escalation. And I th again, I thought the interesting thing was he found this totally by accident, which I think is awesome. Like, just so cool. That was my story number 14. Getting off late, Paul. <laughs> I know, Jeff. It's getting past your bedtime, but I'm having too much fun. So, um, <laughs> not not past my bedtime. It's past my wife's bedtime and my office is off. Vulnerable SSH. Vulnerable SSH. Uh, is there vulnerable SSH? There was a War wormable. Wormable. Well, so there was one article where someone wrote an SSH worm. And the reason why I love this article is because. It's not the first time it's been done. He actually references Vivek Ramachandran's post from, I believe, 2013. Uh, that he said, I used this, and I wrote my own SSH worm. As a, an exercise, I, and I love, this is what I encourage in our community. You don't have to be the first. You may have a different perspective on it. And you looked at this attack vector, and you're like, here's how I would have implemented it. And recognize, it, it called out in the article, look, I'm not the first. I called on Vivek's post and his research to build this. I think that's great. There was also, in our, my article number 15, which I thought was really neat, is that an attacker had swapped out the open SSH binary for a new binary to be able to collect credentials. And in the memory analysis, they were wondering, could we collect the keys and derive the keys and compromise this? Uh, basically, they were attacking the attackers. Can I compromise the attacker's version of SSH? Um, in the oh. memory snapshot that was taken and uh, ended up uh, being able to do that and submitted their research to the 2020 Volatility Framework, which is for memory analysis, their plug-in contest uh, for a way to do that. I thought that was really cool as well. Son of a gun. So yeah, pull the keys from memory, use it to decrypt SSH sessions. Yes. Cool. Yeah, right? <laughs> take, it, take the fight back to the attackers in that... That's uh, one of my oldest tricks. I, those of you that have heard me describe one of the investigations I participated in, uh, I, luckily I, they were using clear text protocols, so I didn't have to do, go through the decryption process back in the day. But if the attackers are using services and leaving their credentials laying around, if you get those credentials, I happened to observe such an attack and reported that to law enforcement and was able to provide law enforcement with those uh, said credentials, which helped eventually lead to a conviction uh, of uh, what was essentially at that time a, a, a group of sysadmins admins that had gone had gone bad. So this story reminded me of that, um, w which is really cool. So with that, Paul, should we wrap it? We should wrap it. Make sure you look at my story number eleven. Stall stack had a new vulnerability, and there is an exploit for that, uh, as well as a write up from uh, Tenable. Uh, actually, Tenable.com had a write-up on that that was um, an unauthenticated attacker could get uh, shell command injection via the SALT API. And this is a new one. Some of you may remember uh, an older uh, previous exploit for, for SALT. This is yet a newer one, so make sure you're up to date uh, on your SALT stack. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching to uh, this edition of Paul Security Weekly. Larry, take us out. Over and out. <laughs> <laughs>